Sir Stiglitz is actually an honorary doctorate uh, of Sciences Po, which he ha was uh, awarded in 2019. His career, uh, during his career, has done many, many important things. Uh, as an academic, as you know, all the economists know that um, Joseph Stiglitz uh, was one of the founders uh, of, the May of the modern contract theory, of the modern international economics, uh, with uh, contributions uh, going uh, back to Rochelle Stiglitz, but also uh, Shapira, uh, Shapira Stiglitz and Stiglitz Weiss uh, theories of uh, um, asymmetric information and their applications to uh, various markets. Uh, Joe Stiglitz uh, got his PhD from MIT in 67. Then he worked in Yale as a professor of economics. He worked in Yale, um, Stanford, Oxford, Princeton, and uh, uh, since uh, several decades, he's a uh, professor of economics in Columbia. Uh, in the last uh, more than 20 years, university professor uh, at Columbia. In 2001, uh, he was awarded um, uh, Nobel uh, Prize in Economics together with Michael Spence and George Okerlof as a, one of the founders of um, uh, theory of in asymmetric information. Uh, since then, uh, he's also uh, worked on many other issues, including uh, the role of globalization, inequality. In many ways, his uh, uh, work, as uh, you know, has been before the economic consensus arrived there, already in 2002. Uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Stiglitz published a book called Globalization and Its Discontents. Uh, at that point, globalization was uh, viewed as a good uh, force for good. Uh, many people, and uh, myself included, still believe that globalization produced a lot of good things, but uh, then the question is about the discontents, many of which have created uh, uh, very important social and political uh, effects that uh, brought us uh, to many crises later on, uh, and these were already discussed in that book. Later on, uh, uh, Joe has worked on issues like inequality and importance of post-crisis European austerity, which he called, uh, I think, Suicide Act, uh, which uh, did contribute to the rise of populism in, in this continent, as you know. Uh, what I've just said, uh, what just described has been of course, more than one academic career, but uh, Joe has also done his share in public service. He was a member and a chair of Council of Economic Advisors in the 1990s during the uh, presidency of Bill Clinton. Uh, he worked as a chief economist and senior vice president in the uh, World Bank. And he's also served, as already has been mentioned many times, uh, together with uh, Jean-Paul Fitoussi and Amartya Sen as a co-chair of the very important commission that was discussed in the previous sessions, commissioned for the measurement. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, uh, when, this, uh, when this commission was established in 2008 and uh, published its report in 2010, later on, uh, Joe has written a book about this. But generally, that created a completely new environment in which uh, we go now beyond GDP, and not just as academic economists, but as uh, Martin Duran just described, uh, at OECD and, uh, um, and uh, many, many, many OECD member countries at the national uh, level. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me give floor to uh, Joe. He will uh, give, give a talk, and uh, I'm not sure if we will have time for questions given how late we are, but uh, at least, uh, at least uh, let, let me welcome uh, Joe uh, to, give, uh, to give his remarks. Well, thank, thank you, you Sergey. And I, I <clears throat> Thank you, and it's a, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, although it's obviously a, a sad occasion. Um, Jean-Paul was a very good friend, and, and one of the, as I walk around this area, uh, there are so many uh, restaurants that I stop at and cafes where Jean-Paul and I would have uh, l lunch or uh, a drink or a coffee. Uh, and we discussed uh, so many different issues, uh, all the issues that have been discussed uh, today, but many more, uh, a lot about politics, obviously, a lot about uh, a, a breadth of uh, interest that, he, uh, that we shared in, in common. 
So there, the, the, as I walk around uh, this area, I, I, I constantly see his, hear his voice and see his face as, as we've seen it uh, in, in the videos that, that have brought uh, him uh, very much to, uh, to life. Um, we were also very much, uh, you might say, comrades in arms. Um, I think uh, both John Paul and I uh, entered economics uh, with uh, not just an academic uh, interest. Uh, we, we did, you know, we, we were both serious about understanding the world and understanding uh, how the economic system work. Uh, but uh, I think we, we both wanted to change it. Uh, we both realized that there were some, you might say, flaws. Some of those flaws uh, became more and more apparent, uh, and uh, more apparent in some countries, like my own, than in others. But uh, we didn't uh, uh, like the way things were. So uh, there were so many issues in which we worked together uh, in one way or another. Um, on, and, and some of them, obviously, uh, in in his home turf in Europe, trying to uh, re redefine the rules uh, of Europe, the growth and stability pact, the 2% inflation target. Um, we uh, worked together to try to uh, change that. But th there were many other topics uh, um, uh, after the um, 2011 Tunisian um, uprising. Uh, Jean-Paul and I tried to get uh, to, to help Tunisia and to try to get funds for Tunisia, to try to work with the uh, new government, uh, to try to create a democratic uh, framework. Uh, not sure we succeeded, uh, but uh, at least uh, we, we never gave up hope. And uh, so there, th these were just a, a, a few of the uh, 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 areas that we worked uh, on together. Um, I, I suppose one of the uh, real signs of uh, being close to each other is uh, his willingness to share his office with me. Um, that's, uh, uh, I don't want to say that it was uh, uh, stingy on, on uh, uh, your school's uh, ability to find real estate. I, I feel, I appreciate that because coming from New York, real estate is the uh, scarcest uh, thing, but I think it was really fun uh, sharing uh, an office uh, when I came, would come to visit uh, uh, for uh, a summer back in 2011-13, uh, and then uh, for the whole term in uh, uh, 2019, right before uh, the th pandemic. Uh, and uh, it really made it uh, so nice because we could then talk all the time about uh, a huge range of issues. Well, I've been asked um, to, well, to talk about um, the, the broad issue of what economic policy for the crisis period. But before doing that, I wanna talk about a few things that I think have been emphasized already, but, but represent, I think, uh, some of the common elements uh, in his um, work. Uh, Jean-Paul saw economics as part of society, that the economy was meant to serve people and not the other way around, as uh, is often uh, the case. He also saw uh, economics as inseparable from every other aspect of society, from political science, from politics, from philosophy. And he believed that economic science could help improve our society and the lives of individuals within it. And he worked really tirelessly, uh, as we've heard all day today, to accomplish those goals at all levels, as a theorist, as a practitioner, as an activist. And he brought uh, commitment, genius, engagement, and thoughtfulness to every aspect um, of, this, of this agenda. Uh, the one area that uh, we were most engaged in together was uh, what Martin talked about before, the measurement of economic performance and social progress. And I think it's interesting, he chose the name of the commission and the economic performance is what you'd expect out of an economist. But he also talked about social progress. 
to emphasize that his, his concern was the evolution of society and that the benefits, how we were uh, changing as a society. And um, uh, as Martine mentioned, it, it was an extraordinarily difficult process, especially, especially the second stage, but also the first stage uh, when we were uh, under uh, Sarkozy. Uh, I should mention that one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I, I, I discussed, you know, what about working with Sarkozy uh, too? Um, and he pointed, there was another reason which is the kind of agenda that we were talking about, uh, measurement of the effects on inequality or on the environment, are what you expect out of anybody from the left. But getting Sarkozy to support this agenda made it more credible, meant that uh, people, we could get on board people like Merkel and people from across the, uh, the OECD less successful than we might have hoped, but still we did uh, it. And that highlights one aspect of Jean Paul's work. He really wanted things to get done. And so this was a case where he thought the best way of getting the, an understanding that we had to go beyond GDP was to get, persuade Sarkozy that this was important and he succeeded in doing this and that provided greater political momentum uh, to, to our entire project. Something that you've heard over and over again uh, today is if you measure the wrong thing, you will do the wrong thing. And if you don't measure something, there is a risk that you will ignore it. Uh, there's a famous story of, of uh, President Reagan uh, approached, you know, we, we, we Inequality started to increase very dramatically under President Reagan's uh, uh, presidency. And uh, so he thought the appropriate way to solve the problem of inequality in America was stop collecting the data. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that was his solution. And of course, uh, now that we recognize how important it is, the real issue is, uh, can we get better data and, and, and uh, more uh, closely trace what uh, uh, is going on? Uh, better measurements can guide better policies. Um, the commission drew attention to the measurement of equality, sustainability. Um, we talked about insecurity, it's come up over and over again, subjective well being. And uh, I want to. Uh, 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 end with a, uh, uh, on this note, uh, uh, a note of a little bit more optimism, uh, maybe coming from a Midwest American. Uh, the glass is uh, maybe a, a, th a third full rather than two thirds empty. Uh, the fact is that uh, countries uh, like Australia, uh, Canada um, are uh, pursuing this agenda and measurement all over Latin America. And what's really striking is it's the ministries of finance in Australia and in New Zealand who are pushing this. And for me, that's a big deal because it means that it's beginning to get into the policy framework. They're seeing this as a way of assessing how well uh, things are, are uh, they're succeeding in, in uh, using their funds, uh, scarce funds, uh, in a good way. And there are other countries, or, or country, uh, new countries, uh, Scotland, who have also been pioneering uh, in this work. The title that I was asked to talk about, and I'm gonna have to talk a little faster, uh, but I can't compete with uh, Philippe uh, <laughs> on the speed, uh, uh, even if I tried. Um, the world faces uh, multiple crises, a climate inequality, pandemic, and now uh, Russia's aggression uh, in Ukraine, the inflation crisis, all these uh, coming on the heels of a global financial crisis, uh, all of these are questioning the efficiency and stability of the market economy. And I'm gonna come back to that and the overall economic philosophy of uh, Jean-Paul. 
Um, but there are several looming crises, the inflation uh, 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 talked about leading to a global slowdown. Uh, there are AI and related changes to technology, some disagreement about discussion about how exactly how much inequality at a global level it will result, but I am very worried. Um, but all of this, and this is, uh, you know, uh, Jean-Paul saw things from a very systemic point of view of all of our society, this is having very big effects on our politics. And we see that in the United States. Uh, we celebrate when we get uh, a little over 50%. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we celebrate that uh, Lula won with a little over 50%. But we have to remember that the other side got 49% and that something has fundamentally happened, broken in our global society that these other um, authoritarian, I don't know how to uh, describe it, but basically authoritarian figures have done so well. So there is obviously something that we ought to be thinking about and, and talking about. Um, and uh, Jean-Paul was intensely aware that the standard equilibrium models, 19th century models focusing on the economy being in a somehow stasis and a balance, uh, really weren't up to the task of analyzing uh, these crises and uh, let alone asking, answering the question of how do we respond to these crises? So, Unfortunately, so much of our thinking, especially as economists, has been shaped by equilibrium models, which I think are really out of sync with the world we face. And, and if anybody, you know, if you just think about the number of crises that we've had since 2000, uh, beginning in 2008, the idea that the society, the, the economy is in equilibrium seems uh, a, a fantasy. Of course, in some countries, uh, the crises seem worse than the others. I won't rehearse uh, all the bad data. <laughs> You've already seen it, uh, but we experience it. Uh, 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 it has the lowest life expectancy. Uh, we had o well over a million people die. We've had the opioid crisis, the hot childhood diabetes crisis. Um, the, um, the fact that these crises uh, are so widespread suggests that we should not personify them. So we talk about Trump, but the fact is the fact that so many countries have similar problems means that it's not just Trump and Bolsonaro. These are people who are, um, uh, are reflecting underlying uh, social economic forces, and we need to think about what those forces are. But what is clear is, and this is something that Jean-Paul would be very concerned with, is that there is a crisis uh, in democracy and a crisis in the confidence in our institutions that uh, uh, Martine referred to. And uh, in the capitalist system and some of the key doctrines that have guided policy in recent decades. Uh, uh, the crisis in, in the capitalist system is actually reflected a survey that I think was done in, at, at Columbia Business School where a majority of students entering the business school at one point, um, uh, you, know, you know, if you're entering business, you sort of think that you should have confidence in the market economy. And the, but they, they had, a majority of them did not have confidence. It was a good way to make a living and survive, but uh, they, they were not actually that enthusiastic about the system uh, as a whole. And uh, particular aspects of uh, the excess financialization, at certain aspects of globalization. Um, and this just highlights the fact that economics and politics can't be separated. Um, and I want to, to emphasize one aspect of that, uh, which is that Jean-Paul would have em emphasized. That is that, um, societies um, that inequality undermines democracies. Uh, societies with high levels of inequality choose to have a weak state because economic inequality leads to political inequality and those at the top want a smaller state with 
They have less need for public goods, and uh, they see a greater danger of the state using its powers for redistribution. Uh, the result of this is there's less investment in high return public goods, and that in turn harms growth. I'm talking about education, infrastructure, basic research, social protection, um, and this uh, highlights the point that uh, Philippe made before, that better systems of social protection can actually encourage innovation because it can encourage uh, risk taking. Well, uh, the point of this is that there's a vicious circle where economic inequality leads to political inequality and that leads to rules of the game that reinforce the economic uh, inequality. So all of this, uh, what I've just said, in many ways has been sho a shock to the, the doctrines that have dominated economic thinking and taught everywhere, so not just, uh, but in almost all economics departments, um, that are sometimes called neoliberalism. It was a dominant doctrine for 40 years. Uh, it claimed that a framework that was basically based on markets, market fundamentalism, although it had a lot of ideology mixed in, so I don't wanna uh, blame economic theory too much. Uh, but it believed that trickle-down economics would ensure that uh, all would benefit. Um, there were many elements uh, of that uh, doctrine uh, that I won't have time to talk about, but the, uh, and many uh, inconsistencies, uh, the fact, as an example, uh, the financial sector said, uh, leave it to the market, don't have government interfere until the market led to a crisis where we had the biggest bailout in the history of mankind. Uh, and uh, when I was, you know, I was uh, uh, on a uh, discussion um, at the, uh, the financial crisis occurred uh, just uh, as Obama was running uh, for the president, it wasn't clear who was going to win. And, and there was a that they wanted to make sure that the proposal would, had bipartisan support, so they got a, a large group of people together on a phone conference. Uh, Obama did, and and said, uh, "This is from the Democrat side. What uh, uh, what was the response to the 700 billion dollar bailout of the banks?" And most of the people on the phone call were were bankers. Um, not surprisingly, um, and the main question they raised was, why only $700 billion? And the, the answer was, don't worry, there's more if you want it. So, <laughs> uh, and there was more. Um, so, this uh, set of ideas, which Jean-Paul Crus uh, crusaded uh, throughout his life against, uh, as the, uh, that experiment is over, uh, the growth after World War II, uh, and the last three uh, uh, is much higher in the three decades after World War II than in the last uh, three de decades, both in Europe and the United States. And contrary to the idea of trickle-down economics, um, the U.S. bottom has seen little increase in its income over the last third of a century. That, dotted, that, that line at the bottom is the average income of the bottom 90%. It hasn't changed at all. Uh, you can see the dotted line is the average income of the top 1%, and you don't need a microscope to see that that's gone up. Uh, the bottom, you do have to see a microscope to see uh, what's happened. And just so you could understand some of the discontent in the United States, this is the uh, average, this is the real wage adjusted for inflation of those at the bottom of the US wage distribution. And uh, there has been no increase in the real wage over 65 years. So uh, if you wonder why there might be some unhappiness in our labor markets, uh, it should be pretty obvious. Uh, the pandemic showed, contrary to the neoliberal framework, that there was a real important role for government. If you ask the question, where would we be without the 
mRNA vaccines without the distribution, without the government response in the economy. Uh, it is pretty clear that without a strong government response, it would have been a disaster. It was still a disaster with a million people dying in the United States, but it would have been an order of magnitude worse. And government played a, a critical uh, uh, role in this and should make us uh, think more uh, carefully about, or more thoroughly about the role of government. Um, I, I have uh, prepared a, a whole set of slides on what was wrong with the neoliberal model, uh, but I'm not gonna go over those, except to uh, say uh, an important point which uh, really echoes what has been said repeatedly today, uh, and particularly by uh, Philippe and by Ned, that there are alternative models to that neoliberal model, a, a, a innovative economy, a flourishing economy. I talk about it in terms of my book, uh, progressive capitalism, uh, that these all involve markets, but they involve a very different kind of market than the just the neoliberal kind of uh, economy, and they reflect Jean-Paul's commitment that we have to look at things not just in terms of GDP, but in terms of a whole set of other aspects, whether it's uh, the enabling of individuals to flourish, to, to realize their potential, uh, a sense of security, reduction in deprivations, re uh, sustainable uh, economy, uh, uh, all of these uh, are important uh, aspects. Um, so there is an alternative to the neoliberal model, and, let me, and that is something that I think Jean-Paul uh, uh, strongly uh, pushed to cr the creation of that alternative. Well, I want to spend the last few minutes talking very quickly about uh, uh, how uh, Jean-Paul would be talking about the inflation crisis that we're facing uh, right now. Um, and some of these are ideas that he, he uh, talked about uh, before he died, and, and some of these are my interpretation of how he would respond to, with the new data that has come in. So um, let me begin by just saying uh, the important thing. You begin with a diagnosis of what the problem is, and uh, contrary to what most central banks seem to be acting as if they believe, and a few economist uh, uh, rhetoric, inflation today is not caused by excess of aggregate demand, by, but by pandemic and war supply side interruptions and sectoral demand shifts. And you can see that across sectors, uh, energy, food, automobiles, housing, um, and the excessive, ex excess pandemic support and high pandemic savings um, is now only gradually being spent down. Um, and uh, in the US is being sp uh, spent disproportionately on traded goods, which have a low multiplier and are unrelated to the inflation. And uh, um, some of the inflation is exacerbated by uh, the increase uh, 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 in and the exercise of market power. And just to show you this, we did a calculation of the real aggregate demand in the economy, add up conventional, this is really just elementary economics and economics 101. You add up real consumption, investment, government expenditures, and net trade. This is for the US, uh, but I think there's similar data for, for Europe. And what you see there, and then we used uh, uh, CBO's current estimate, or most recent estimate, of what the economy's potential output in each quarter, and we've done this in various ways to confirm this. And what you see is consistently the aggregate demand, the actual GDP is that reflects the aggregate demand where the economy was. Uh, the aggregate demand was substantially below potential supply. So it was not uh, 
aggregate, it was not excess de aggregate demand that was driving this inflation. And everybody sort of knows that. You see it in the inflation in oil and food. It seeps into the rest of the economy, but the real source is, uh, is these sectoral uh, areas. Um, there has been a striking increase in market power in, the, in, the, in uh, markups uh, with uh, increasing most in the sectors and firms with uh, the highest markups. Uh, the point I want to come to is uh, not the diagnosis but the solution because this is a, a, a key issue facing uh, Europe today. The remedy that uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve has relied on and unfortunately had uh, ripple effects around the world, including in Europe and the ECB, is raising interest rates. Um, in many ways, what the uh, Federal Reserve uh, is, has set out to do should is to me outrageous. <laughs> um, uh, the, what they have set out to do is to increase the unemployment rate. Uh, they have said, the chair of the Federal Reserve says that it's going to cause some pain. He doesn't say who it's causing pain to. He's cause, it's causing pain particularly to the low-income people who are the, the marginalized, the African-American, uh, the other groups who are going to be bear the brunt of this unemployment. Typically, young African Americans have four times the unemployment rate that the average American. So if we increase our unemployment rate on average from 4% to 6%, their unemployment rate will go up to 24%. One out of four will be unemployed. Why would the Federal Reserve set that out as its aspiration of what it wants to do. Meanwhile, it wants to slow down wages, which real wages in the United States have been falling, absolutely. And what does a lower real wage mean? I showed you in that previous chart what's happening to markups. If you look to profits, it's the same thing. The Federal Reserve is deliberately setting out to increase the profits of our corporations and increase the suffering of those at the bottom. Why should that be viewed as good public policy or even acceptable public policy? But that uh, is what it's setting out to do. And the, what is particularly outrageous is that the benefit from this is very little. It is not, you, you know, I'll ask a rhetorical question if there were students here, I, I would say, is it likely that raising the interest rate is going to lead to more oil? It will, will persuade Putin to deliver, or uh, MSB, to deliver more oil? No. Is it going to lead to more food? No. Is it going to lead to more chips and cars so we our car prices come down? No. It actually can be counterproductive. And there's a very important model that was referred to earlier, the Phelps Winter model, that explained how higher interest rates actually lead, induce firms to raise their prices. Higher interest rates make it more difficult for firms to respond to the supply bottlenecks, making the investments that we need to alleviate the supply bottlenecks. So this high rate interest rate policy is counterproductive if you care about inflation. Well, um, there are some aspects of this that I want to uh, emphasize very briefly in two or three minutes that are particularly relevant for Europe um, because uh, uh, there has been um, a ideological, I think, predisposition uh, to rely on uh, a very flawed framework for pricing of electricity, 
which has contributed a great deal uh, to the uh, inflation, and a ideological aversion to, to imposing windfall profits taxes. Now, when you go to war and Europe, I mean, the West should view itself as at war with Russia. Uh, when you go to war, normal economics doesn't work. Uh, and no country ever went to war without changing some of the rules of, of economics. And the reason should be obvious. If prices uh, are temporarily high, say of oil, if they're high in the long run, we expect demand and supply responses to, equi to, to help us adapt to the new situation. But if prices are temporarily high because the war, and we hope the war will be over in six months, a year, we don't know, but we, it, it's, it's inevitably a temporary situation because even if the war is not over, we will learn how to respond. But, but the, 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 in the short run, a firm is not going to go drilling for oil recognizing that in the long run, climate change means the price of oil is going to come down. In fact, it's even so short term with the remarkable thing is fracking in the United States has not gone up. And fracking for oil is a three, four year payback. So if you thought oil price was going to be high for four years, you would have increased the production. There is no supply response. You're not gonna install new insulation in your house if you think it's gonna last for just one or two years. So in an economy in which there is not the supply response, what is the main consequence of an increase in price? Redistributive. So you impose a high cost on your society in terms of redistribution with no benefits in allocation. It's actually worse than that. There are very negative effects on allocation because what happens? You raise uh, the cost of energy, of electricity, and small businesses go out of business, not because they're fundamentally inefficient, but because they can't manage in the short run the price of electricity. So you're destroying good firms. So there are two consequences of this, two implications of this. First, you ought to be ta having a windfall profits tax. The oil companies who are making huge amounts of oil and oil traders and lots of other people like, who are making huge profits didn't do anything to deserve it. <laughs> These are really windfall profits tax. And a windfall profits tax won't discourage investment, won't discourage employment, it just takes some of their excess profits and makes them available for use for a whole, protecting the vulnerable. So uh, that's the first thing you should do. Um, but the second thing is to, uh, and using, I say, some of those funds to protect the vulnerable, but the second thing is the system of electricity pricing, which is based on the highest marginal cost, which is very good for day of time pricing under normal times, is a disaster for wartime. And actually, de the, the, that system of regulation was used to manipulate the electricity price in, in California so that not even uh, advocates of deregulation in the United States believe that that kind of pricing actually works anywhere, even in normal times. But in abnormal times, and these are abnormal times, that system that says that uh, electricity should be linked to the marginal cost, uh, the highest marginal cost, uh, has enormous allocative effects with very little, uh, I mean, it has enormous distribution effects with very little allocative consequences. 
the example of that that is most uh, dramatic is the case of Norway, uh, which is an energy exporter. It has a high level of hydroelectric, uh, ex exporting oil and gas. The price of electricity has gone up eight, nine-fold. Now, you can imagine the citizens of Norway are not very happy that what has gone on has just been a massive redistribution. And ironically, a lot of it is a redistribution to a government-owned enterprise. And the German insistence on adhering to so-called rules of the game so that there is a level playing field and no state aid has resulted in massive state aid in a in a in a in a, in a uh, hidden form in massive bailouts of some of their energy companies. So it, it is an intellectually incons incoherent uh, framework. So let me just conclude. Um, uh, the oh, oh okay. Um, I hope uh, what I've just said uh, uh, is in the spirit of, of Jean Paul. I think he it, it would be. I think he would be concerned uh, about looking at this situation not from an ideological point of view, but by the real effect it has on our society, and. Uh, he would recognize uh, the insights of Keynesian analysis. He would see the economy from a holistic perspective. He would pay attention to the distributive consequences of the policy. Um, he would uh, uh, oppose conventional wisdom. Uh, he would say uh, he was always opposed to the 2% inflation target. But the wealth of evidence that now uh, the inflation target should be moved unambiguously away from that 2%. It is really a dangerous, uh, uh, it was a number that was pulled out of thin air. Um, it's a number for which there's no scientific basis. Um, we will miss Jean Paul's keen insights into the drivers of the multiple crises we face and how we might find socially just solutions to them. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Joe. Um, thank you. Thank you for the kind words about John Paul and also for the very timely analysis. Uh, we are uh, about 40 minutes behind schedule, so I think uh, unless there is one big pressing question, no, people, people understand that we need to move to the next session. Thank you so much, Joe, and uh, I, I invite uh, Xavier and uh, Lisa. Lisa Fitoussi to conclude the conference. Thank you. Avant de se quitter, je laisse la parole à Lisa qui va dire quelques mots de physique et après je fais quelques remerciements. Ne partez pas. Euh, Lisa, le micro va venir. Ça marche euh, Oui, il y a un petit délai. Ça marche Ouais. Euh, alors, euh, avant de nous quitter. Je voudrais vous remercier très chaleureusement pour votre présence et plus particulièrement remercier chacun des intervenants pour avoir accepté de participer à cette magnifique journée d'hommage. J'ai bien sûr une pensée appuyée pour Sciences Po et l'OFCE, pour Mathias Vichra, Xavier Rago et tous ceux qui de près ou de loin ont permis la réalisation de cette journée qui restera gravée dans nos mémoires et dans nos cœurs. C'est donc avec beaucoup d'émotion que je m'exprime devant vous ce soir. Et pour reprendre une expression de mon frère, David, lors d'un hommage à notre père le 30 septembre dernier à New York, je marche dans tes pas. Car marcher dans les pas de mon père, c'est pour moi la question de la transmission, qui est un honneur, un privilège, et dont je mesure dans cet amphiboutenie l'importance. Ceux qui ont fréquenté cet amphi savent à quel point il est le cœur de Sciences Po, tant il a vu passer les plus grands professeurs et intellectuels du monde entier. Mon père était l'un d'eux. Imaginez-vous qu'il y a enseigné pendant 27 ans. On m'a rapporté lorsqu donnait, que lorsqu'il donnait 
court euh, l'amphi était toujours plein, et qu'il s'adressait aux étudiants sans notes, sans jamais lire de notes, ce qu'ils admiraient beaucoup, même si de ce fait, son poli n'était jamais à jour. Maintenant, permettez-moi d'évoquer quelques points importants sur son parcours et sa personnalité hors norme. Tout d'abord concernant Sciences Po. L'équité, la justice sociale lui tenait particulièrement à cœur et a guidé deux de ses actions majeures en faveur des étudiants. Tout d'abord, Mathias en a parlé tout à l'heure, la réforme des frais de scolarité en 2003. Et ensuite, un autre fait majeur qui était la suppression de l'épreuve des 24 heures lorsqu'il a été le président de, du jury d'agrégation en 1999-2000. Et croyez-moi, c'était un truc assez dingue. Euh, mon père était en total accord avec la vision de Sciences Po en matière d'enseignement. Pour lui, l'économie était interdépendante des autres disciplines de sciences morales, le droit, l'histoire, la sociologie, les sciences politiques. Selon lui, il était nécessaire de dépasser les frontières des matières pour dessiner de nouvelles perspectives. Sa trajectoire internationale, ensuite, a commencé très tôt. Elle était d'ailleurs visionnaire, merci Jean-Luc, puisque, en tant que doyen de la faculté d'économie de Strasbourg, il a invité des professeurs étrangers à venir y enseigner, et notamment Nicolas georgescu rougen en 1977-78, mais aussi Axel Lyonofood, qui nous a quittés en mai dernier, qui était professeur d'économie à UCLA, et bien d'autres encore invités à l'Institut européen de Florence et encore à l'OFCE. Cette pratique a généré des échanges avec les plus grands économistes de la planète et lui a permis de jouir d'une aura très particulière au niveau international. J'en ai pour preuve la journée du 21 juin 2013, Sciences Po, célèbre Jean-Paul Fitoussi, qui réunit cinq ex économistes extraordinaires autour de mon père, Kenneth Haro, Robert Solo, Amartya Sen, Edmund Phelps et Joseph Stiglitz. Cinq grands économistes, tous prix Nobel, mais surtout cinq grands amis. Mon père n'a jamais dévié de sa ligne intellectuelle des sujets dont il était intimement convaincu. était un Européen de la première heure, mais pour lui, l'Europe était d'abord politique. Elle devait prévaloir sur toute Europe économique. Et on sait aujourd'hui à quel point il avait raison. Il a eu la pédagogie pour intégrer l'économie dans le débat public, mais pas que, dans la famille aussi. Nous avons beaucoup, beaucoup débattu. Il voulait aider les gens à réfléchir sans dogmatisme, mais au contraire, analyser la réalité afin d'en tirer des, des enseignements. C'était un keynésien que n'ai-je entendu à propos du fait que mon père était keynésien. En 2002, a été publié chez Gallimard, oh, merci Jean-Luc encore, « Pauvreté dans l'abondance » de Keynes, qu'il a préfacé avec Axel Lyonofood. Mon père écrit de Keynes, je cite, « Les essais montrent que Keynes était un lutteur intellectuel, non seulement au sens où il applique une grande énergie à vouloir faire triompher ses propres idées, mais en ce qu'il était persuadé de leur justesse, et de l'importance de leur victoire pour l'avenir du monde. Une citation sous forme d'autobiographie pour moi. Dimanche soir, toujours en discutant avec Jean-Luc, ce dernier m'a rappelé que mon père était aussi un bâtisseur. À l'origine de la création du BETA à Strasbourg, le Bureau d'économie théorique et appliquée, qui a fêté d'ailleurs dernièrement ses 50 ans, il a créé aussi la faculté d'économie de Strasbourg, a fondé le département d'économie à l'Institut européen de Florence. Pendant de très longues années, il fut le secrétaire général de l'Association internationale des sciences économiques. Pendant 20 ans que dura sa présidence à l'OFCE, c'est à lui que revient le fait de lui avoir offert un rayonnement international, international pardon, et le prestige qu'on lui connaît. Il a ouvert un département de l'OFCE à Nice, et aussi est à l'origine de la création du département d'économie à Sciences Po. Pour conclure, j'aimerais un instant vous parler non plus du professeur émérite, mais du père et du grand-père qu'il était, de l'homme et des valeurs qu'il défendait et qui ont façonné sa trajectoire si exceptionnelle. D'une profonde humanité, d'une gentillesse qui faisait l'admiration de tous, il a eu pour nous, sa famille, pour notre mère, mon frère et moi et ses petits-enfants, Noah, Lola, Sacha et Solal, 
un amour inconditionnel. Pour nous, il était intentionné, tendre et inventif, comme en témoigne la berceuse qui nous a tous fredonné et qui est d'ailleurs devenue un tube familial, ainsi que son fameux sifflement de ralliement des fitoussis. Même lorsqu'il débo était débordé, il nous prenait toujours au téléphone, car nous restions sa priorité. Disponible, son écoute était à la fois bienveillante et tolérante, et avec lui, nous pouvions aborder tous les sujets et avoir des discussions sur tout. Il était mon interlocuteur préféré. Il avait une très grande empathie et beaucoup d'humour. D'un naturel optimiste, pour lui, l'espérance avait une très grande valeur. Garder l'espoir était un de ses maîtres mots. Doté d'une intelligence visionnaire, il avait une compréhension profonde de notre condition d'être humain et de ce que cela peut représenter ou impliquer en termes de souffrance, de combat et de difficulté. C'est ce qui lui a permis, d'ailleurs, d'approcher la théorie économique avec cette acuité si particulière, j'ai nommé le sens du réel. Sa grande humilité et la simplicité avec laquelle il parvenait à m'expliquer des choses d'une grande complexité m'ont toujours fasciné. La valeur de l'amitié était pour lui cardinale. Des amis, je veux dire des vrais amis, il en avait dans le monde entier de Strasbourg à Florence, de New York à Los Angeles, de Paris en passant par Rome, il a su nouer des liens indéfectibles avec des êtres rares et dont la présence aujourd'hui à nos côtés nous est si précieuse. Et s'il y a une chose dont nous, sa famille, devons lui être infiniment reconnaissants, c'est de nous avoir permis d'évoluer dans un univers aussi riche intellectuellement. Mon père aimait les plaisirs simples de la vie, les pâtes cuites al dente, était quand même un élément fondamental de son art de vivre. Il adorait la musique, ça le mettait en joie. Il aimait beaucoup la science-fiction, ses livres préférés, 1984 d'Orwell, Le meilleur des mondes d'Aldus Huxley, Chronique martienne et Fahrenheit 451 de Ray Bradbury, des ouvrages qu'il tenait tant à partager avec nous et dont il aimait discuter. Je finirai par ceci. La question de la traduction fidèle de la pensée par le langage a toujours été essentiel pour mon père. Je le cite dans le premier discours de vœux de bonne année qu'il a fait en tant que nouveau président de l'OFCE le 22 janvier 1990. Il disait « L'écriture comme la parole sont la manifestation de la volonté de communiquer. Que la clarté était donc une courtoisie que l'on devait à ceux dont on souhaitait se faire entendre. » Dans son dernier livre, intitulé « Comme on nous parle », l'emprise de la nouvelle langue sur nos sociétés, mon père précise sa pensée, je le cite. « Effacer un mot, c'est comme jeter des livres et amputer de milliards de combinaisons notre capacité à nous faire comprendre. Rien ne saurait le justifier. C'est une violence que d'être privé d'un concept pour exprimer sa pensée. Au bout du chemin, c'est la pensée elle-même qui rétrécit. Lorsque les mots pour le dire manquent, eh bien on ne dit pas, où on dit autre chose que ce qu'on voulait dire. Cet héritage, son héritage, je le porte désormais en moi. Il a une telle valeur d'exemple à mes yeux qu'avec mes mots à moi, je formule l'espoir de toujours parvenir à m'exprimer le plus clairement possible et préciser ma pensée, et ce, en toute occasion. Je marche dans tes pas, papa. Merci beaucoup Lisa. Cette journée était très bien organisée, sauf la gestion du temps, mais ça c'est notre responsabilité à tous, économistes. Et toute la partie administrative était très bien organisée grâce à ceux que je voudrais remercier maintenant, qui sont les services de Sciences Po, je pense à Caroline Alain, Thomas Larrivé qui ont fait les vidéos, et surtout à beaucoup d'équipes administratives de Sciences Po et de l'OFCE. Il y a une personne qui a mis une énergie extrême dans l'organisation de cet événement, aussi bien que c'était le mariage de son fils, pour tout vous dire, ou de sa fille. Et c'est Corinne Alouche, et je voudrais la remercier là. Merci.
beaucoup de réflexions euh, absorbées dans cette journée très intense. Merci à vous d'être là et euh, à bientôt. Il y a maintenant une commémoration. Comme on est un peu en retard, je ne sais pas ce qui va se passer, mais nous y allons et très rapidement. Merci beaucoup et à bientôt.